Well, good morning and welcome. Good morning and welcome. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to welcome you to Covenant Presbyterian Church as we gather together as we're called by Him, our Lord, to worship Him. Just want to let you know that there are some, uh, you know, the worship guides are in the back, and there are also some handouts for the sermon, so don't forget to get those if you want to take notes. You know, you, there, there's some blanks for you to fill in. And uh, uh, other than that, if you're a visitor with us, well, welcome. And there are some visitor cards in the back for you to fill in, and you drop it in the offering plate when it comes to you, and that way we'll have a record of your attendance if we want to get in contact with you. We have a means to do that. And also for prayer requests. In the back of that card, there is a space for prayer requests. If you want us to pray for you, put your prayer request in there and also drop it in the offering plate when it comes by. Without any further, let me call your attention to the cover of our worship guide. There are some verses printed for you there as we prepare our hearts for worship. And I think... We're doing a cappella today, right? So this will be a silent preparation for worship. Just read that verse in silence, and we'll prepare to worship God. It is the Lord himself who calls us to worship. Let us then stand for the call to worship from Psalm 33. Let's read responsively. Shout for joy to the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the Lord of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord that heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Because he spoke and it came to be, he commanded and it stood firm. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence. You've called us here. You told us to shout for joy. Lord, we don't come because of our righteousness. We come for the sake of your son's righteousness. And for those who believe in him, praise, praise to you, thanksgiving in your presence, melody, even in our hearts. This is what we're supposed to do. Lord, we ask you that as we engage you in worship, engage us. Let your spirit, Lord, do a work in our midst. Let your spirit calm us, rest us, give us peace. Bear fruit in our midst, even now. We continue to ask you for all this and more as we even pray that prayer which your son himself taught us praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let us then sing together all glory, laud, and honor. Father God, in all our heart, we sing your praises and we adore you. We give you thanks and we give you honor and glory. For you delight in your people. You lead us into righteousness. You discipline when we become proud. And you strengthen us when we are weak. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for being in heaven and making earth your footstool. In your name we pray. Amen. And from the Heidelberg Catechism, we're going to be reading question one. Christian, what is your only comfort in life and death? That, that I, I body and soul, soul both in life and death, and not in my own, but belong unto my faithful Savior, Savior Jesus Christ, Christ, who with his precious blood has satisfied all my, all my sins and delivered me from all power of the devil. devil. And so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head, yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation, and therefore be by his Holy Spirit. He also assures me of eternal life, and makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live with him. And now our hymn, Gloria Patri. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. Woo! <laughs> 
It's time now for our prayers and petition that we bring to the Lord. So let us pray. Gracious Father, whom we have in heaven but you, and there is nothing on earth that we desire besides you or in comparison with you. When our flesh and our heart fail, Lord, be our strength of our heart and our portion forever. We come in the name of the great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, who is able to sympathize with our weakness and is therefore able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. It is in his, his name that we present our prayers and petitions. Father, our hearts are filled with sorrow for the deadly violence perpetrated against Covenant Presbyterian Church and its school in Nashville, Tennessee. Please pour your comfort of peace among those who are grieving. Please strengthen Pastor Chad Scruggs, who is mourning for his daughter, his very daughter, Haley. And, we must lead his, that, and he must still lead his church and his family in the days ahead. We ask that you give him that strength. We ask that this tragedy bind us together instead of tearing us apart, and also that it gives us the opportunity to share your gospel of hope. Lord, we thank you for being with the members of our church who went yesterday to market days and invited the public to attend this service. Lord, please soften our hearts for those in our families who have not accepted Jesus as their Savior. Please bring to our church families in the neighborhood who have not heard the call of the gospel that they may repent and receive Jesus as their Savior. Please keep blessing and growing Pastor Gama's church, The Crossing, in Edinburgh. And we thank you for all things, Lord. Amen. And now our confession of sin. Go ahead and uh, stay seated on that, and we'll go ahead and read that together. Merciful God, you pardon all who truly repent and turn to you. We humbly ask for our sins and ask for your mercy. We have not loved you with a pure heart, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have not done justice, loved kindness, or walked humbly with you, our God. Have mercy on us. In your great compassion, cleanse us from our sin. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Do not cast us from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain us with your bountiful spirit. And now our silent confession, uh, confession uh, confessing our sins one by one. And our assurance of pardon comes from Romans 5, 8 through 11. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have not now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved from him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Amen. And now let's stand for our hymn of renewal. Approach my soul, the mercy seat. my soul the mercy seat where Jesus answers prayer there humbly fall before his feet for none can perish there 
thy promise is my only plea. With this I venture nigh. Thou callest burdened souls to thee, and such, O Lord, am I. Bow down beneath the load of sin, by Satan's sorry breast. I war without and fears within, I come to thee for rest. Be thou my shield and hiding place, that sheltered near thy side. I may my fears accuse and face, and tell him thou hast died. O wondrous love to bleed and die, to bear the cross and shame. That guilty sinner such as I Might plead thy gracious name You may be seated. Amen. Beautiful words. If you would please open your Bible in Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10. We'll continue in Matthew. We're going to read verses 24 through 33. I think it says probably 26 to 33 there, but I just decided I'm going to read 24 to 33, you know? So it's okay. Well, this chapter, chapter 10, Jesus is instructing his disciples, particularly his ordained apostles, as I've said uh, repeatedly about their work. That's what chapter 10 is about. And in it, he has already given them instructions for their work. He has alerted them of the dangers of their call and then how to go about their work in wisdom, like serpents and innocence like doves. And then on the verses that we're going to read first, 24 to 25, Jesus is going to give us the goal. What is the end game of discipleship? The goal as we're going to read in a minute here, is to be made into the likeness of Jesus. It's to be like Jesus. A disciple, when he's fully trained, he will be like his teacher, is what Luke, in the parallel passage of Luke, says. And then on verses 26 through 42, they are connected to that goal of being made in the likeness of Jesus. Because the goal, it is because... The goal of a disciple is to be like Jesus, that they will need these three exhortations or encouragements that come from verses 26 through verse 42. These exhortations, they are going to lead us, they're going to lead the disciples towards the goal of being like Jesus. And today we're going to look at the first exhortation, which is about fear. Jesus is going to begin saying, do not fear. Stop fearing. But then he's going to say, fear. And then he's going to say, do not fear. So which is it? Fear or not fear? And you saw the title there, right? To fear or not to fear. That is the question. And you guys see what I did there, right? With Hamlet and Shakespeare and stuff? Okay. I had to point that out, I guess. Well, let me pray for us for light. And then we're going to read God's word. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks that you did not stay silent. You're not a God who stayed silent. You spoke with us. You revealed yourself to us. You did it through your word. We ask now that in the name of Christ, your spirit, your spirit may give us light that we may understand these things. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, let me read verses 24 through 33. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough 
for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So, or therefore, have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So, or therefore, everyone who acknowledges me before man, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before man, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God, it stands forever. If you like to take notes, this is your first blank, right out of the gate. Disciples are often tempted and pressed to fear. Jesus knows this. Jesus knows that fear is real in the life of a disciple. And I, I'd be comfortable with saying that fear is inescapable. Inescapable. And David, the psalmist, King David, who wrote the Psalms, agrees. We just read from Psalm 56, 3. It was, our, it was in the cover of your worship guide as a preparation verse. And we read on verse 3, <clears throat> When I am afraid, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. Not if I'm afraid, but when. When I'm afraid. Therefore, disciples do need an exhortation, an encouragement, an encouragement concerning fear and we will also see in this passage that Jesus in his incarnation he had the right kind of fear and his disciples must follow Jesus in fearing or in thinking about fear the way he thinks about fear in fearing the right thing and the goal that I have for, the, for you this morning is that you would, you, know, you would think about fear the way that Jesus thinks about fear. And here is, here's what could solve your problem of fear, is to think about fear the way Jesus does. The disciple of Jesus who grasps what Jesus is teaching here in this passage, he will have an effective weapon against fear so that when he is tempted or pressed to fear he may actually be able not to fear so here's your next blank when you are afraid when you are afraid think about fear like Jesus does during his incarnation as, as a true man and true God two natures united in one person Jesus dealt with fear. And Jesus did so without any sin. And this is how Jesus thought about fear, even during his incarnation. And this is our first point, the, the, your next blank there. Don't fear the cover-up. Don't fear the cover-up. Look at verse 26 again. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Have no fear of them. Them there are the ones from, you know, chapter, uh, verse 24, 25 that we read. They are the ones Jesus is talking about in those verses. They are the ones blaspheming him. Have no fear of them. They are the ones blaspheming him who will then turn to blaspheme the disciples as well. Jesus, is, Jesus was not afraid of those who would spread all kinds of lies about him. He did not fear that. And he also did not fear 
the perception of his ministry, that he was insignificant and, and progressing slowly. He didn't fear that either. The, the, the reality is that those who blasphemed Jesus, they had a very deep misunderstanding of who he was and of his mission. And Jesus did not fear what people were thinking about him. Jesus did not fear what people were thinking about him. Did you ever see in the Gospels, do you remember, can you recall of Jesus in the Gospel calling up a press conference to defend himself? No. Trying to explain away the blasphemies that those, that them were throwing at him. People lied about him all the time. And people will lie about the disciples too. And for the moment, for the moment as Jesus is teaching this to his disciples, the truth about Jesus was going to be covered. For the moment, the truth was going to be whispered in corners. It was going to be covered for that moment. But he assures his disciples that eventually all of it was going to come to the fore. All would be revealed. All the truth would be revealed that's the word for apocalypse there. The revelation, it would be revealed. It would be made known. And in fact, what Jesus is telling his disciples here has come to pass, has he not? The truth has been revealed. It has been made known. For all of those who blasphemed Jesus during his ministry, it has then and now has become patently known. Throughout the world, even, that they were wrong about Jesus. They were wrong. He has now been revealed, he has been made known that Jesus was exactly who he said he was, and he came to do exactly what he said he came to do. In other words, Jesus has been vindicated. He said he would die. He, sorry, he said he would die. And he died. He said he would rise on the third day. He rose on the third day. He said he would build his church. He's building his church. He has ascended to heaven. And we have now enjoyed more or less than 2,000 years of the reign of Christ. All that he's been vindicated. And his kingdom continues to advance. And I use this expression, cover up. Cover up. Because our culture is quite averse to a cover up, isn't it? Our culture hates a cover up. Our culture, I mean, we don't want, we no, no one here really wants anyone to get away with lying about people's businesses and reputations. We don't want that. We don't want someone tarnishing, slandering someone's reputation and getting away with it. We don't like a cover up. We don't want people to do that to us. We don't like when the truth is covered up. It is as if it's natural for us. We, we don't want the truth to be covered up. Even hypocrites criticize hypocrites. Hypocrites don't like hypocrisy. <laughs> we don't want things to be covered up. And this is a huge encouragement, isn't it, for us, the disciples? Because we fear what people cover up. We, we fear when people get away with stuff. We fear when they say things about us and they get away with it. And Jesus is saying, don't fear that. It will all be revealed. It will all be made known. It is going to come to the light, Jesus is saying to his disciples. All truth will be made manifest. Now, if you do have something to hide, if you do have something to hide, this is really not helping you with your fears. This is, this is terrifying. 
that all truth will be manifest. But let's confess. Let's confess that when we find ourselves in the situation that the disciples find themselves here in this passage, what we really worry about is what people will think about us. We want to control what they think about us. We are uncomfortable if they think about us, if they blaspheme us, if people, if the public opinion does not reflect reality. That's what really bothers us. And we fear that. We want to control the narrative about ourselves. That's that's what the disciples are concerned about many times. You will see that through the Gospels. What are they going to think about us? What are they going to think? What will people think about me? That's a very powerful fear. A very powerful fear. And Jesus is speaking to that. What will people think about me? Jesus is saying, one day everyone will know the truth about you. Don't worry. Don't fear. Don't fear what people would think about you. One day, all truth about you will be revealed. It should be interesting to you that even as I speak here, that's what's happening. We're once again vindicating Jesus and even his disciples. Of course, specifically in this passage, specifically, you can see this, right? There's a specific thing Jesus is referring to in this, in this passage that will be revealed. He is talking about the disclosure of the plans, the plots, uh, the conspiracies of those who hate him and, his, and those who follow him. And then you have the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the authorities and their secret plans. Jesus is saying all of that is going to be exposed. All of the false accusations laid against Jesus are going to be vindicated. That's what he's talking about. And that just encourages us. Because it does gives us what we need to against that fear that we have that we will be accused of things and not vindicated of falsehood. There's no falsehood, there's no conspiracy, there's no plan, there's no secret plot that is not going to be revealed and made known. There's no sin that is not going to be made known. And that disclosure will bring about justice. So those who follow Jesus, we, can, we don't have to fear that. We can just go about following him and living our lives. One of the ways that reveals things is history, right? History has revealed. History has come to pass, has revealed that Jesus is who he said he was. He's rose from the, history has come to pass. Jesus said Jerusalem would be destroyed. What happened in history? Jerusalem was destroyed. That's one way God uses to reveal things, history. But in this passage, we have another type of disclosure. Another type, something else. Another instrument of being made known. Look at verse 27. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. What Jesus is saying here is that don't be afraid of proclaiming the gospel. Don't be afraid of proclaiming the kingdom. Your proclamation is actually a means of making these things known. The proclamation of the gospel by the disciples might momentarily make them victims of blasphemies. blasphemies. People are going to lie about them. The proclamation of the gospel might momentarily have that effect. But built into our proclamation of these things, of the gospel, is this point that I'm trying to make, that when we proclaim the gospel, part of that proclamation is what? All will be revealed. All the secrets of the heart. You see that for a disciple of Jesus, proclaiming the gospel is perhaps one of the greatest encouragements for them not to fear. Because then you get to remind yourself, like, oh, this is what's going to happen. This is the truth. This is what's going to take place. I don't have to fear that things will be covered up. 
This is what I believe. So the proclamation is one of the means by which God reveals all truth. The word of the Lord is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates the hearts. It discerns the thoughts and intentions of people's hearts. So God uses the proclamation of the gospel to make things known. That's one of the means. So when you're afraid, think about fear like Jesus does. And Jesus was never afraid that things were going to be covered up. That anyone was going to get away with blaspheming him, lying about him, tarnishing his reputation. You don't have to fear that either. Next, you got to ask this question. To think about fear the way Jesus does, you got to ask this next question. This is your next blank. Who or what should you be fearing? Who or what should you be fearing? Look at verse 28 again. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now Jesus does know that enemies can kill his body. It is true, the disciple of Jesus, he can be killed. But Jesus is affirming that the worst enemy they have cannot, can only kill their bodies. No one can touch their soul. And that's what Jesus is affirming, that we are body and soul. His disciples are body and soul. And no one except God can afflict their soul. That's what it's saying. And the disciple, the disciple who fears God, he or she will not be afraid of men. By the way, Jesus in his incarnation, Jesus had the fear of God. Jesus had the fear of God. In Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, is a prophecy directly about Jesus. Listen to this. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. It's talking about Jesus. A, a, a shoot from Jesse, the son of David. And he continues. And the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And then in verse 3 of Isaiah 11 says, His delight will be in the fear of the Lord. Jesus, what Jesus shows us in his life is that the fear of a son and the love of a father, they are not incompatible. They are not opposites. They are not competing with each other. You know, my children, my children, they have a very healthy filial, the, the fear of children. They have a very healthy filial fear, reverential fear of me as their father. But at the same time, they should also have assurance of my love, of my affection, of my care for them, of the lengths to which I will go to preserve them. They should have that. But those are not incompatible. It's the fear of a son for his father. And Jesus then had the perfect fear of the Lord as the Son of God. And he's saying that it is God who has the power over life and death. It is God who can destroy both body and soul in hell. The word for hell there, the word translated for hell there, is noteworthy. Is the word Gehenna. It's just describing a particular place around Jerusalem. It was the Valley of Hinnon. And that valley is where uh, some people, even kings in the Old Testament, sacrificed their children to Molech. King Josiah, during his reform, he desecrated that place. That place is utterly cursed, and it became the dumpster, the, dump, the dumpster fire. It became the dumpster fire. That's what it is. The trash is thrown there, 
and then it is incinerated by fire. And that fire always burns, constantly burns. It's, that's the metaphor that is often, most often used for hell. That's hell. And God, do, listen, what this passage is saying beyond doubt is that God is the one who's in control of that place. God is the one who's in control of that place. It is a place of destruction. And I take that destruction here means... That when God sends someone to that place, the place of trash, the place of refuse, his enemies who are sent there, they will be rendered absolutely incapable of fulfilling the original intent of who they are, the original intent of their lives. They are garbage. All hope is destroyed there. There is no return. It's destruction. They will never again have the chance of bearing God's image the way they were supposed to do. They will never again have the, the chance of glorifying God or enjoying Him. All enjoyment of God is over. They are ruined. Their purpose is gone. They're destroyed. All that is left is punishment. It's punishment. And the metaphor is the, the dump burning without ever being consumed because the garbage is always there there is always more and you can see now that someone who doesn't fear this something's going awry in their thinking but also, something who doesn't fear God, someone who doesn't fear God, someone who doesn't fear God, the truth is that they will fear everything else. They will be afraid of everything else. They'll be afraid of people. They'll be afraid of danger. They'll be afraid of death. They'll be afraid of anything, of their shadow. They will, they will be paranoid. They will flee while no one pursues. They'll be afraid of their own emotions. Someone who doesn't fear God is afraid of spirits, is afraid of Satan, demons, ghosts, aliens, you name it. They're afraid of it. And Jesus is also saying that. And what he is calling his disciples to do is like, look, this is who or what you should fear. I want you to trade all your fears. Get all your fears and trade them in to this one reasonable and rational fear of God. And that's all, that's all you will fear. That's it. And when you do that, <laughs> when you do that, what are you going to find? You're going to find Christ. When you do that, you find Jesus. When you do that, you find repentance of your sins. You find forgiveness of your sins. When you fear God, the very next scene, listen, this is in scripture constantly, constantly. When you fear God, the very next scene in the chapter of your life is Jesus touching you in your shoulder and saying, do not be afraid. Because the fear of God and the love of God are compatible always and forever. That's all you need to fear. I think it's worth pointing in the context here that the worst your enemies can do with you if you follow Jesus is to kill you. That's the worst they can do. How does Jesus think about fear then? When they did to Jesus the worst they could do, what happened? He was immediately with the Father. He was in paradise. He told the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. He was immediately with the Father. Immediately. The worst they could do with Jesus was to expedite the fulfillment of his mission. Three days later, he was risen. 
That was the worst they could do with him. You know what that means to a disciple? That the worst someone can do to someone who's following Jesus, someone who's pilgrimaging to the presence of God in heaven, the worst someone can do to you is put you on a rocket ship, is expedite all that God has reserved for you. That's it. And Jesus is using that logic to tell us not to fear. That's why David, that's why David was able to say in that passage you read on preparation, he said, what can men do to me? Man cannot do anything to me. What can flesh do to me? Nothing. And Christians have used this as an encouragement to, to live as Christians. I'm reminded of, of a preacher. There was a preacher in the Reformation. He was one of the reformers, one of the Reformation leaders in England. His name was Hugh Latimer. Hugh Latimer was a preacher and was a very good one. And J.C. Ryle, who also was, is one of my favorite preachers, he did a lot of work on the Puritan pastors and the Puritan preachers, and he tells this story about, about Hugh Latimer. Because, because he was such a capable preacher, one day he got to preach to King Henry VIII. Okay? And as he was preparing for that, Hugh Latimer realized that what God had laid in his heart to preach was going to displease King Henry VIII. So he, he started praying. Actually, he didn't start praying. He started talking to himself, saying this, Latimer, Latimer, do you remember that you are speaking before the high and mighty King Henry VIII, who has power to command you to be sent to prison, and who can have your head cut off if that would please him? Will you not take care to say nothing that will offend the royal ears? Then he paused that conversation in his head and he continued, Latimer, Latimer, do you not remember that you are speaking before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, before him at whose throne Henry VIII will stand, before him to whom one day you will have to give account of yourself? Latimer, Latimer, be faithful to your master and declare the word of God. That's how you use what Jesus is teaching here in your life. What can men do to you? So you need to think about fear the way Jesus does. If they kill me, what are they doing? That's the worst they can do? It's to fulfill my mission? <laughs> That's what Jesus thought. And then, but, but, Right after that, Jesus gives to us what I think is like the greatest comfort. This is the greatest one now that's coming here. It's your next blank. This is how Jesus thinks about fear. Contemplate God's providence. Contemplate God's providence. Jesus, he is not only concerned with your soul. He's not telling the disciples, I only care about your soul. No. He knows his disciples are both body and soul. And this is it. This is the most amazing comfort for the disciples of Jesus concerning fear here. Look at verse 29 again. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Not one of them will fall from to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore... You are of more value than many sparrows. So what, what Jesus is saying is that customarily at the day, at the time there, you know, sparrows are very cheap. They were clearly a dime a dozen. Two for one penny. And, and you would eat them. And they were seemingly cheap. Very cheap. And God is saying, Jesus is saying, look, your father, he values them. They're cheap for you, but your father does not let one of them fall from the sky without his hand. He is the one. Whoever is eating a sparrow right now has to realize that God has 
provide that sparrow to their table. That's what he's saying. God's providence has done it. Just like the sparrows, the hairs of your head are all numbered. Some of you have less hair than others. God knows all of them. They are all numbered. Not one of them has fallen without his will. Not one of them. This is an expression of the day to say, no one can touch you if your father does not allow. No one can touch you. Not a hair from your head can someone touch if he doesn't allow. If he's not involved apart from him. And then there is more. Because if that, that would have been enough. You know, no one can touch me unless God is involved. But then God says, and you are much more valuable than sparrows. Confirmation, you are treasured. You're treasured. Takes care, does he take care of sparrows? No one cares about them. They buy them two for one penny. But you, you are treasured. Many sparrows. He cares for them, then you, much more valuable. Contemplate nature, because nature itself is telling you, is it not? Nature itself is telling you that God takes care of you. You are more, he, he, Jesus is saying, look, I know my father, and I know that you are of more value than all of these little animals. And God cares for all of them. And of course, we know that disciples are more valuable than the animals. Because Jesus died for the disciples. They are worth infinitely more. He died for them. Is, is God not going to provide for them? So let's talk about that word providence. What is this anyways? What is this word providence? What is this word well, it's related to the word provide. And when we apply it to God, what we mean by that is that God cares constantly for the provision of all his creatures, all of them, all of his creatures. And the words of the Westminster Confession are printed for you there on your handout because they're so good. I wanted to give them to you even with a blank. So there's a blank there for you as well. Look, look what we believe. This is what the Bible, this is the summary of what the Bible teaches concerning providence. God, the great creator of all things, does uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things from the greatest even to the least by his most wise and holy providence. According to his infallible foreknowledge in the free and immutable counsel of his own will, to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. But he gets even better. As the providence of God does, in general, reach to all creatures. Do you see what it's saying there? Not a hair, not a sparrow can fall from the sky without God's will. His providence is for all creatures. That is true. So, after a most special manner, in a most special way, it takes care of his church. That's your blank. Of his church. And disposes all things to the, God, to the good thereof. This is what we confess. This is very clear in scripture. This is the testimony of scripture that, yes, God disposes all things specially for the good of his disciples. Of the disciples of Jesus. Of the church. That's very encouraging. This is how Jesus thinks about fear, is it not? He know, do you know why Jesus walked about so freely, so confidently in his ministry? Even as many pursued him to kill him even? Because he knew, no one can touch me. If anything happens, it's for my good. God's providence is for me. The Father's providence is for me. Especially for me. Anything that happens to me. 
just as we confessed a minute ago, is, subser is subservient to my salvation. It serves my salvation. Jesus knew that. In providence then, what does providence do for you? When you contemplate God's providence, when you look at your life and you see like, wow, you know, when I look at my life, I can see things that took place that God has done it. How else could I explain it? And they fill me with hope. Disciples of Jesus, they can always do that. Things like the story of this woman that I'm about to tell you. There's many of these, by the way, okay? I can tell you a myriad of stories like this in the lives of disciples. Of God's providence, taking care of them as they follow Jesus. Encourage them, like, do not fear. Things like this will happen to you because I am taking care of you by my hand. Though it be an invisible hand, it's right there. The story of one of Mrs. Honeywood. No one you know, because she lived like in the 17th century, you know? But she was a parishioner of a pastor in the 17th century. And John Flavel, another pastor, tell the story in a book that he wrote about providence, about God's providence. And the story is Mrs. Honeywood was in the pits of depression. She was in the darkest hour of her soul, Mrs. Honeywood. She had put aside all comfort, she was hopeless and in despair. And then her pastor came to see her and is starting to try and encourage her. But Mrs. Honeywood is not having any of it. And then she says this. This is what she does. She says, Sir, I am sure to be damned as this glass is to be broken. And what she was holding in her hand was one of her Venice glasses, which if you don't know what that is, it's like a crystal, very fragile, that if you drop on the ground, it will break. And she said, as sure as this glass will break, very expensive, and she was ready to break it. I'm sure to be damned. There's no hope for me. And she, she does this, throws it on the ground. And then both of them were in awe because that glass did not break to what her pastor looked at her and said, what do you think that means? What is this? This is God's providence. Encouraging this woman. Because the goal for her life is that she should not be afraid. She is treasured. And nothing can separate her from the love of Christ. That's providence. By the way, there's so many stories like this. This just happens to be one of my favorites. That's why I'm telling it to you. I hope it's of encouraging to you as it is to me. That God has all the hairs of my head counted. That his providence would do something stupid like this. Isn't it? It's so silly. He preserved that glass. And that woman, what do you think happened to her? Her mind changed. She's like, oh, yeah. How can I deny this? Because the pastor said, what do you think this means? You know what this means. Miss Honey, would you know what this means? You can come out of this. Don't, don't fear this. Come out of this. And then, finally, there's the... Inference, if this all is true, then this is the next thing. This is how Jesus thinks about fear. And he says this, well, profess publicly your allegiance. This is your next blank, your allegiance to Jesus. Profess publicly your allegiance to Jesus. That's verse 32 and 33. So, so there is therefore. Therefore, all this is true, right? Don't fear, fear God. Don't fear, because all the hair, God's providence, contemplate God's providence. All the hairs of your head are counted. Don't fear. Therefore, profess publicly your allegiance to Jesus. 
And that's verse 32. Therefore, everyone who acknowledges me before man, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before man, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. The word for acknowledge there is the word for profess. Confess or profess. And it always means publicly. Like, acknowledge publicly that this is the case. Acknowledge Jesus. And likewise, whoever denies, whoever publicly says, I do not know him, I don't have anything to do, I have no relationship to him, then Jesus will say, well, I don't know you either. I don't know you. That's what Jesus is saying. And if, as we continue through Matthew, and if you know Jesus' story, we're going to get there, you will see that Jesus was particularly dreadful of one thing of a break of fellowship with his father. Particularly dreadful of that. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this then should be the most dreadful thought for a disciple. (laughs) Can a disciple fear anything more than this scene? Is it possible for a disciple to fear anything more than this can someone who has experienced communion with God Father Son and Holy Spirit fear anything more than what Jesus is describing here as a scene in their lives I don't think that's possible this is it this is what you should be most fearful of obviously not of simply telling people that you believe Jesus. That shouldn't be what you fear most. But let me give you some encouragement. One of my favorite commentators, I think he wrote this, of course he wrote this to you. He's from the 16th century. He says this, a more public confession of faith without a doubt is demanded from teachers than from others in the church. That's what he says. Pastors, elders, teachers, a more public profession of faith is demanded from them. Besides, not everyone is endued with an equal measure of faith in the same proportion, nor with the same gifts of the Holy Spirit. However, however, there is no believer whom the Son of God does not require to be his witness. There is no such believer. In what place, at what time, with what degree of frequency, in what manner, and to what extent we ought to profess our faith cannot be easily determined. But that it is your duty, it will be shown in time. In other words... If you haven't been, look, if you haven't been fearful, because that's the word, fearful, of publicly professing your faith in Christ, well, you're in good company, because as we're going to continue through Matthew, we're going to find Peter. Peter, that's what Peter did. Peter denied Jesus publicly. But then Peter was restored. It doesn't matter how many times you've done that. One, two, three, you can be restored. But on the other side of that restoration, or rather, between that sin of denying Jesus and the restoration of publicly professing Jesus is this thing, which is the realization that what you really want is communion with God and that you fear not having that. It's repentance. It's communion with God. It's faith in Christ. Do you see that? Between the denial and the restoration is this thinking about fear the right way. What is it that I fear most? Ah, it's this scene. I don't want Jesus to say, I never knew you. To my Father in heaven. 
This is a dreadful thought. It's a dreadful scene. So publicly profess your allegiance to Jesus. Publicly profess your allegiance to Jesus. This is how Jesus thinks about fear. This is, this is how the disciples should think about it too. Don't fear the cover up. Who or what should you be fearing and contemplate God's providence? Think about God's providence in your life. And once you do that, what you realize is that professing your faith publicly, <laughs> that's not what you should be afraid of. That's, not, that, that's nothing to fear. The real fear is to lose God. It's to lose God. To lose fellowship and communion with him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you do know us. You know that often we are nothing but fearful pilgrims. Fearful pilgrims. We ask that we may begin to... Oh, Lord, Lord, would you help us to think about all our fears and to begin to think, and think about them the way your Son has taught us to think about them in the way this passage has described for us. Because we know that at the end of this is, is conformity to the image of your Son, sanctification. Lord, help us not to be fearful, but help us to, to think about it this way. Will you continue to bless the remainder, Lord, of our worship? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let us respond to the preaching of the word of God and sing together, God moves in a mysterious way. And as the musicians get to the front here, William Cooper, uh, who wrote this, William Cooper, who wrote this, he was a parishioner of John Newton. John Newton was his pastor. John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, he was his pastor. And William Cooper, the story goes that he wrote this hymn uh, on a particular time of his life when he was also on, under severe depression, severe depression, to the point that he would lose his mind. And this is about providence, this, this hymn, God Moves in a Mysterious Way. And the story goes that he, he left his house one night, he called a cab, to pick him up in his house so that it could take him to a bridge so that he could jump from the bridge. But there was a thick, either there was a thick fog that night or the cab driver who came for his, to pick him up knew him. One of those two. And then the cab just rode around with him very long time as if they were lost in the fog and dropped him off back at his doorstep. And then William Cooper did not carry out his plans. And, and this is the context of this hymn. This is who William Cooper was. And this is a man who's experienced God's providence in his life in a very sweet way. So let's sing together as we respond to this. God moves in a mysterious way His wonders to perform He plants His footsteps in the sea And rides upon the storm Deep in His fathom of all minds Of never-failing skill he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage, take the clouds ye so much dread. Are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind the frowning providence, 
He hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. You may be seated. There is, in fact, no better illustration of God's providence for the church than what's right in front of you on this table. There is no better illustration of God's providence to the church than this meal. Because think about all the things that God has orchestrated in nature to give you this meal. The kings of the earth, the leaders, the judges, they all got together to kill Jesus, to destroy Jesus. Satan wanted to stop him. All things, all things was, were conspiring against this. And yet, here it is. For you, for you, the meal that casts away all fear. Like I said earlier in the sermon, when you come to the Father, when you come to God in fear, what you find is Jesus, what you find is Christ, what you find is this invitation to the table, to the household, so that you may come and eat and who is then invited to this meal? This meal is for the disciples of Jesus. This meal is on the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is his table. This is his household. He is the one who decides who's welcomed to this table. Who is this table for? Well, this table is for those who are in his family. They have, been, they have received the sign of the covenant. They have been baptized in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they have professed publicly their allegiance, their faith, their trust in Christ. This is who this table is for, for those who are in the family of God. It is His table. If that's true of you, then this is your table. If you see yourself as a sinner who needs forgiveness, and you have professed faith in Christ, and you've been baptized, this is your table. You've sinned yesterday, and you're repentant, this table is for you. But if those things are not true for you, then what you need to do, you know what you need to do? You need to contemplate God's providence. You need to look at it and you need to think about these things. You need to think about what they mean. Because what this table also means is that if you're not united with Christ through faith, then whatever it is that this represents, it's what's going to be done to you. Without faith in Christ, all that's left is hell, is punishment. It's judgment. Because this is what this means. This is the judgment of God that fell on Christ so that we could eat it and be nourished instead of dead. This is what this means. So, let me pray, set these apart, and go on to the words of scripture we'll move on to this meal Heavenly Father 
is with thanksgiving in our hearts that we bow before you and pray that you would set apart these common elements bread and wine that for us they might be the body and blood of our Savior not in any superstitious or carnal way not in some empty nonsense but rather by faith in the reality of the spirit of Christ and your word working together that when we eat Lord we may know that we are feeding upon Christ and upon all of the benefits of the covenant of this blood Lord we pray this in the name of Jesus Amen what Paul, the apostle, received from the Lord, he also delivered to the church that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, Jesus also took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the gospel. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Beloved, I'm going to invite the elder Scott. Can you come, please, to serve us? Do I have any other ordained elder here? No. So... Uh, Jim, are you able to come serve the people as a deacon? Would you be able to do that for us? So, I just realized I should have done the words first, you know, to make this smoother. I want to pray again. We don't pray enough, so I'm going to pray again. And then, as you're ready, you're going to come. You're going to come through the middle aisle. You're going to be served by this gentleman. The white cups... They have juice, and the red cups are wine. White cups, juice. Red cups, wine. And there's two cups stacked. Both of the elements are there together. You're going to take it back to your seat, and then we're going to partake of it together, okay? As one, as one body. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, continue to work in us, even through... Lord, th th this meal is, is a sign of your forgiveness for us in Christ. Lord, we give you thanks. Amen. As you're ready, please come. left without.
Jesus said, this is my body. Let's take and eat. Jesus said, this is the new covenant in his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's take and drink. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this meal is our nourishment. Lord, as we have repented of our sins, we ask you that we may now be strengthened to new obedience. Help us to continue considering how we may walk in a manner worthy of this call. Help us to walk in, in a manner of those who eat at your table, who belong to you, who abide in Christ, and who bear fruit according to this meal, to the gospel. Your mercies, Lord, they are new every morning, and we can still taste them in our mouths. Lord, let it be a seal to us of your grace in our lives. Please, Lord, <laughs> our worship, our worship is, is not perfect. But we come because you have proclaimed to us righteousness in Christ. That your Holy Spirit may abide with us and continue to enable us to walk in strength as becomes those who have received these promises that you've just given us. We ask you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, beloved, let us stand then, respond to such a gracious meal and sing amidst us our beloved stands. Amidst the sun, beloved stands, and lead us you its pierced hands. Point to the wound at feet and side, bless the sons of the crucified. What would the joyous souls when at his table sits the Lord, the wine how rich, the bread how sweet, when Jesus sends the guest to meet, he now with eyes defiled and dim, we see the sun but see not him. Only his love the scales displays, and bid us see him face to face. O glorious bridegroom of our hearts, your presence may be seated and as we continue in worship obedience and thanksgiving to God with the giving of tithes and offerings here is the work that we partner in right after lunch here right sorry right after this service we're gonna set the tables out and we're gonna eat together so we have lunch here today following the service by the way part of that meal is provided by tithes and offerings so that's that's how that money is spent on it's our fellowship together around the table and i hope it is a joyful one so if you if you don't have lunch plans stay with us linger here we're going to eat 
right following the worship service. Wednesday nights continue here at 6.30 p.m. If you're thinking like, oh, I'd like to know more of these people at Covenant Presbyterian Church, well, a great way to do that is to be here on Wednesday nights. We sing some hymns together. We do a short, sweet Bible study, and then we pray for one another afterwards. That's what happens here on Wednesday nights. We have some coffee. We have tea. Some people bring some <clears throat> pastries and sweet things. So it's, it's a great time on Wednesday nights. And the women's Bible study, if you're interested in that, it continues to study 1 Corinthians. They meet in a home, and the details can be gotten by, from Lisa Gutierrez, her, te uh, her telephone number. You can text her or email as it is there. Well, let us then pray in thanksgiving to God, and then we'll sing the doxology. Heavenly Father, you provide for us. It is by your invisible hand of providence that all things come to pass. It is by your hand that, Lord, we have uh, sustenance, that we receive paychecks. Lord, first, fill us with thanksgiving. Fill us with thanksgiving. Lord, also fill us with generosity that we might participate in the work of your kingdom financially. Heavenly Father, cast away every fear that we have from not having enough, but let us bring all our anxieties to you, that you would care for us, because thus far you have. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let us sing the doxology. Please stand. Praise God from we go with the blessing of the Lord. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You're dismissed. Amen. Let's eat.